All right, we're going to get started. We want to say welcome, good morning, and welcome to Agape Chicago's mm -hmm. online service. We are here every Sunday online, but we're also in the park on Sundays. But because the weather is a bit challenging this morning with rain, we are in our church office <coughs> broadcasting to you live. Uh, we want you to know that we will be out into the park as long as the Lord allows us out there. Uh, we're striving to get out there through October 25th, Sunday, October 25th. So uh, there's a possibility we might be chilling <laughs> in the park on a Sunday. But tell you what, bring a sweater, put it on, and uh, bring your heart so that God can speak to you in, in, a, in a community setting because we are thirsting and uh, really hungry for community. And so, again, we welcome you to Agape Chicago. I want to go through uh, some announcements this morning uh, before we really get started. And it's about our Agape communities. Uh, we thrive and sharpen each other in communities. And Agape Chicago has Agape communities that meet so that we might sharpen each other. Uh, on Wednesday, this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., the Blue Sky Agape community will be meeting at the Johnsons. Uh, contact Steve Johnson at stevejohnson34 at hotmail.com. I'm Steve Johnson, and the Agape community Blue Sky reaches out to folks who are on the streets of Rogers Park, and that's our passion, that's our heart, that's our target, that's where we extend and extend our love and the grace that God has given us. So if that's something that burns your heart, please contact me at uh, stevejohnson34 at hotmail. Another Agape community called No Returns zeroes in on refugees and, and refugees, yes. And they will be meeting on Zoom. It's an electronic online meeting on Wednesday, September 16th. Uh, in order to become a part of that Agape community or to feel that out, if your heart's for refugees and making people who are not from here comfortable in being here, then that's the place that you need to be. Contact Laura Bruggers at L N Bruggers, that's B R U G G E R S, L N Bruggers at gmail.com and uh, make a connection with Laura if your heart burns for refugees. Our Works in Progress Agape community zeroes in on entrepreneurs and artists. And so if you're an artist, it doesn't matter whether you're whittling wood or whether you're a, a full-blown painter, uh, Works in Progress is the place for you. If you've got ideas for business and starting a business, Works in Progress is the place for you. Works in Progress will meet at 7 p.m. at the vaults on Tuesday, September 8th. Please email Pastor Jeremiah at Jeremiah Vault, V A U G H T, Jeremiah Vault at gmail.com. Uh, we're all called to pray, and uh, when someone pulls together and, and prays, it is a wonderful and effective thing. Uh, the women have a prayer meeting that will be meeting on Zoom, electronically online, at 7 p.m., Monday, September 7th, at 7 p.m. On Zoom. If that's something that you're interested in, please contact Molly Hassett at Hassett, H A S S E T T, Hassett M B at gmail.com. Hassett M B at gmail.com. Normally, like I said, we're outside, it's raining today, uh, but when we are outside, we need help. We need help in setting up. Uh, chairs and, and breaking down chairs when we're done and if that's something that you're interested in doing or you desire to help us out in, please contact Ralph and he will let you know what role you can play in doing that. So uh, please feel free to approach Ralph uh, anytime either by email through Agape Chicago this week or if you know his personal email or you see him in person, contact Ralph about helping Agape Chicago set up on Sundays. Normally when we are inside, especially during the fall, winter, spring seasons, uh, we spend that first Sunday of the month in prayer for healing. Uh, 
So today is our day for prayer and healing. And if you have a prayer and you need to make a prayer request for healing, please make sure that you contact the leadership team, contact our elders. That would be Pastor Jeremiah, uh, that would be Stephen McCausland, and myself, Steve Johnson. Please let us know, text, email, through Agape's website, through Agape's email. Uh, if you have a prayer request, we desire to pray for you, to pull uh, you and put you before the throne of God and ask for the grace and the mercy that you need in your time of need. So uh, before we go on and get started, I'm going to have Stephen McCausland come up and lead us in worship and song. Stephen? And the song is The Lion and the Lamb by Brenton Brown. You can find the words online and sing along. receive it and that we're able to leave here Lord God walking in wisdom uh, 
the fine example of the virtuous woman uh, teach us this morning through the words of you've offered Pastor Jeremiah so that he might offer them to us. Allow your grace to work in our hearts, uh, to move in our lives, and to touch the lives of others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We've been covering the first section of the book of Proverbs this summer. We've covered Proverbs 1 through 9, and Proverbs 1 through 9 has been dominated by this lady wisdom. Wisdom has been personified in, um, in this lady. And so after that, there are several chapters of pithy little sayings that are good for wise and, and holy living. And then we get to a section in Proverbs, Proverbs 31, that we're covering today, that is the virtuous woman who is the embodiment of everything that you could learn from the book of Proverbs. So this morning, we're taking a look at Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10, A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sasses. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Man does not live by bread alone, but man it is by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Please invite Pastor Jeremiah for the preaching of the word. Over the years, something I find interesting happens on my phone conversations with my grandfather. Uh, after a few minutes of speaking with one another, uh, there's a brief pause, and on the other end I hear these words. Oh, that's you, Jeremiah. Now, why does it take him so long to identify me? Well, first, he doesn't have caller ID on his old landline. Uh, secondly, I usually launch into our phone conversations with this line. Hey, granddaddy, how are you doing today? Uh, but most importantly, on the phone, uh, my older brother and I are indistinguishable from one another. Uh, we sound almost exactly alike, even to our grandfather. And I find that very interesting um, because we didn't even go to the same elementary school. And you say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, that's, uh, that's an irrelevant issue. Of course you and your brother sound alike. You had the same models of speech and, and diction and even Southern Appalachian accent at home by which you model and follow an example of even the most basic thing is speech. And if you think that's correct, you are right. 
and why certainly, even while I was growing up, I modeled my older brother's speech patterns and his habits. I learned to speak like him because I was around him. He was my model. He was my example. And even something so basic, so regular, so habitual as speaking patterns and many of the virtues and practices in life that we have, we pick up through the examples, through the models around us. Most of what we learn in life, whether we realize it or not, is caught rather than taught. Now, you might hear me say that and think that perhaps I would minimize the type of learning we do at school or even churches. Uh, Certainly, I would never want to do that. Uh, The things that we learned at school, arithmetic, reading, writing, and doing science projects, uh, forced us to learn quite a bit along the way. Uh, But none of those particulars that I just mentioned force us to learn, I think, quite as much as something we all dislike. Uh, What is that thing I'm talking about? Why I mention this, the dreaded test. The test often is what forces us to prove what we have learned. It forces us to reckon with how far we are along in understanding a subject matter. And it forces us, if we're not very far along, to actually dive in, cram, force uh, uh, an understanding of a subject matter that we perhaps haven't really tried to comprehend up until that point so that we might pass tests and therefore attain our highest education and degree. Now, I suggest this uh, to you because I'm not, again, undermining the fact that we learn in other ways or to suggest that tests uh, are going to accomplish long-term learning, but to help us understand that both models and tests are both important in learning and apprehending something. And that's important to me today as we end our book in the, uh, as we end our study in the book of Proverbs by looking at this virtuous woman, uh, Proverbs 31. What I want to suggest to you today, church, is that this woman is both a model to us of all the wisdom we've been celebrating all summer long and therefore simultaneously a test of whether we desire it or not. You see, if she is a model of wisdom, an embodiment of wisdom for us, the question whether we desire to be like her, whether we desire her, whether we celebrate her, tells us a great deal of whether we desire, seek, and celebrate wisdom. Now that's quite the claim, and so I intend to help you see the very thing I'm seeing, to see what I'm declaring to you today, And to help you with that, what I'm going to do is to take our sermon into two parts that help you see that what I'm saying is not simply uh, something we're claiming, but is in fact present in Proverbs 31 and connected to the rest of the book of Proverbs. So today my sermon is broken up into two parts. The first part is wisdom's model, and the second part is responding to the test. Wisdom's model, and second, responding to the test. So first, wisdom's model. And when I use the word model, I mean something like example, pattern, paradigm, embodiment. I mean the thing you look at and you want to become like. Uh, Many of us are familiar with certain types of models that are celebrated for particular cultural standards of beauty today. Uh, That's not the type of model I'm celebrating, but a model of wisdom, an embodiment of wisdom today. And to help you understand the Proverbs 31 woman and what she means in relation to Proverbs, let me acknowledge a few things that you've probably heard about this Proverbs 31 woman before, especially if you've grown up around churches. Many women have almost undoubtedly done some sort of Bible study, some sort of teaching on the Proverbs 31 woman as an example for both married and unmarried women of femininity. Now, I think this is a good thing in a culture that denies the feminine is even a thing. I agree with that way of approaching Proverbs 31. Men are also encouraged to look at the Proverbs 31 woman as the sort of wife a man should want. The sort of having the sort of virtues a husband should celebrate in his wife and being the sort of woman you would want in your community. And again, that is absolutely correct. Proverbs 31, the entire chapter, even before verse 10, is written by the mother of King Lemuel. And she is writing this to him so that he may know what to look for. So that is absolutely right again. But more foundationally than either of these two things, an example and a model for women, or an example for what men should search for, 
this woman in the book of Proverbs is a model of the wisdom that's in Proverbs 1 through 9. And that allows me to kind of also agree with what you just heard about why we are jumping all the way from Proverbs chapter 8 to 31 today. You see, over the last few months, we have been looking at Proverbs 1 through 8, 1 through 9, uh, which is really part one of Proverbs. And part one of Proverbs has lots of extended teachings on wisdom and its manifestations. Chapters 10 through 30 are full of disconnected but very important individual <coughs> Proverbs. They are not necessarily thematically linked, but they have been useful to supporting our study in the book of Proverbs before. Those individual Proverbs could sound like this. A harsh word stirs up anger, but a gentle word turns away wrath. Raise a child in the way it should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Better to live on the corner of a roof than in a house with a quarrelsome wife. And you see how those three Proverbs, like many of the Proverbs, don't necessarily relate to one another, but they offer us general wisdom. And so what we've done today is we've sped forward to chapter 31, again, another time where you see extended teaching to see especially Proverbs 1 through 9 embodied in this particular woman. Now, one last thing I want to get off my chest before we dive into the text and help you understand a little bit of what, about what we're doing. It might be easy for you to assume that we're doing a study on Proverbs 31 because we've been having these interesting conversations about the adulterous woman, and it would seem necessary to kind of get rid of the embarrassment of having done that by looking at a virtuous woman. That's not the reason we're doing that, nor, nor am I simply trying to uh, appease a certain uh, concern of people, but rather I actually believe, and I think I'll show you today, that Proverbs 31 is exactly the fitting in to this series that we've been going to. You see, like Steve just said, Proverbs, last week we heard, is given to us that we might pursue lady wisdom, a woman, and reject lady folly, also a woman, who's embodied in the adulterous woman I just mentioned. And so to see the counter of the embodiment of lady folly, we must see the embodiment of the beautiful vision, the good and the true. It is easy to say what is wrong in a woman, but it's hard to describe what is wonderful. And who better to do that and to point us towards this lady wisdom in, in flesh than a mother who knows the difference between the good and true and wants to make sure her son knows the difference? Am I right, ladies? We need to hear from a woman as she sends us home with an understanding of what lady wisdom would look like in a woman. So let's begin by understanding the connections again from with, between wisdom that we've been unpacking and this woman. We begin in Proverbs 31.10. It says, A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. The mother begins this Pro Proverbs 31 section, which is an acrostic in Hebrew, which I, can't, I, I cannot show you today because, again, we don't know Hebrew together. But he, she begins with a question that presents a dilemma. The dilemma runs like this. Where can you find such a woman that I'm going to present to you? She is difficult to find. Like ruby, silver, and gold, she doesn't grow on trees. At this time of the year in the Midwest, you can go many places and find apples growing on trees. There are a dime a dozen. But finding a gold bar in the sands of Lake Michigan are very difficult indeed. And the beginning of Proverbs 31 presents to us the problem that the Proverbs 31 woman presents. She's hard to find. She's rare. She's unique. She is exemplary and true. In fact, again, if you've heard the second part of that verse that she is more valuable than rubies, you should recall something. It should make connections for you. For this summer, our entire celebration of wisdom has been as a pursuit of something more valuable than gold, silver, and or rubies. The familiarity and connections between this woman and wisdom continue in verse, women, uh, verse 11. It says this, Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. That seems like obvious overstatement and hyperbole, doesn't it? To have a certain type of wife means that I no longer lack food, shelter, water, clothing, and other valuable things? How is this possible? 
How can having such a woman resolve so much of what is necessary in a man's life? The answer to that question is resolved in verse 12, and especially in connecting verse 12 to the rest of the wisdom that we've studied this summer. It says, She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Consider how valuable we see lifelong friendship, how rare and how unusual it is. Add to that how much of a dream it would be to find that type of lifelong fidelity, that type of companionship, not just with any old friend, but with the person you've pledged yourself to for life. Why, that's the sort of thing of fairy tales, it seems to us, not the sort of things of hard, cold, harsh wisdom. Wisdom seems to suggest that there is no such thing as happily ever after. Who could hope for something like this? And again, the Proverbs recognize the difficulty of finding such a woman. She is rare. She's unique. She's special. Likewise is wisdom. And we find that in Proverbs 3, 15 through 18, which we studied earlier this summer. Speaking of wisdom, it says this, She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. Why, you see the obvious connections here, don't you? Don't you? Why, if she has riches in a hand and blessings in another and peace, those are the sorts of things that money cannot buy. It is difficult to become rich. It is impossible to buy peace, as we're finding out in this world. It's impossible to buy a long life. Why even the rich and the celebrities amongst us are passing away, it seems, at a rapid rate. You cannot buy this sort of thing, and yet wisdom offers it to us, and the virtuous wife offers it to us. Riches and even a tree of life, which was lost at the Garden of Eden when humans fell, is in her hands. What a blessing she offers to us, not just in terms of friendship and peace, but she's in long life, she's also able to take a little and make it a lot. Like folly can take $500,000 and destroy it, so a wise wife and wisdom can take 5000 and make it quite a bit. Wisdom is difficult to acquire, as is this type of virtue. It is wonderful, it is true, and it is good. This sort of a woman is rare. And so we've seen the first way that wisdom and this virtuous wife is similar in their value. But we're going to see a second way in that they both work. And that they both work. You see in Proverbs 31.15 that this woman gets up before the rising of the sun and begins to work. And in 31.18 she keeps her candle, her, she keeps her lamp burning at the end of the day so that she can continue to work with her hands. She is consistently working uh, at her, her work. And she is working both inside and outside the home and for her family, as we will see in just a moment. But as we look at Proverbs 31 15 and Proverbs 31 18 and see this diligence that she has at the beginning and the end of the day, this should again conjure up an image in your mind if you are remembering our sermons thus far this summer. That image would be the image of my insect friend, my not-so-cute friend, the ant. If you remember, the ant was the one who I told us we should model our, our vision of work on and how we work, but also the reasons why we work. But if that didn't quite reach home for you, if you have a hard time wanting to be like an ant carrying heavy loads and working all the time, then look to the virtuous woman. Look to the virtuous wife for the way that you should work, the, the, the pattern of your work that you might be like her. Like the ant, she can carry that load. And like I mentioned, she works inside the home and she works outside the home. This virtuous wife works diligently to make sure that not only are her children clothed in the wintertime, as these passages tell us, but that she also adorns them with scarlet. Now, I don't know uh, the benefits of wearing scarlet, but it certainly sounds nice to me that she adds that to her. But not only does this woman know, woman know how to mix it up and make sure the home is taken care of, she knows how to mix it up outside the home as well. We know that she is able to go and bring wealth from far away. She literally works 
in marketplaces. She goes and buys a, a field and makes it into a vineyard. She's able to do domestic work and she's able to do work in the marketplace. I can remember, especially in the early 2000s, uh, there was a great concern over uh, the influence of progressive thought on women in general and wives and families in particular in churches. And uh, not a few pastors would preach something that would sound like this, that uh, wives and families especially should do everything they can to make sure a woman can devote all of her energies and time to working at home. Now, I am a big believer that a woman should have, if possible, the opportunities to work where she would. A, a, a sacrificial husband would work to make that possible for her. They would constantly be communicating on the sorts of work she would like to do. Uh, obviously, the virtuous woman celebrates work, but this passage seems to give lots of wheel in the I say seems, it gives lots of leeway for where a woman works. Besides that, the Bible doesn't actually spend a lot of time telling us where a woman can or cannot work, but rather it spends a lot of time telling us the sort of professions that are good and not so good, and also who we're working for. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us how much a woman should work at home or in the marketplace and underground or in outer space. Um, by the way, ladies, if uh, you were to choose between working underground and outer space, go boldly where no man has gone before. <laughs> but all I'm trying to say to you, thank you, I've got to laugh out of that. There are lots of jokes in here that would have been great for the beach, I promise. But uh, today, today, what I want us to see is, is that, again, the focus on this passage isn't where a woman can or cannot work, but what she works for. And to see that, I want you to look at Proverbs 31 19 through 20. It says, In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Now, these two verses present obvious uh, a pattern. Uh, one, she works for her family. Two, she works for her neighbor, especially the poor. That pattern is made all the more apparent if we were again able to read Hebrew. In English, you see that the nouns are arms, hands, uh, arm, excuse me, uh, uh, it's arms, fingers, uh, arms, hands. In Hebrew, it is arm, it is fingers, it's fingers, hands, uh, arms, arms, hands. Excuse me for confusing. But the idea is simply this, that there is a mutual reciprocation in these, in these words. There is a realization that there's a symmetry between working for your family and working for your neighbor, especially the, the poor, the weak, the disenfranchised. Though this topic did not come up at great length in Proverbs 1 through 9, several times in the individual Proverbs, we see a celebration of being concerned with the poor. We're told in those individual Proverbs that the righteous know the rights of the poor, but the wicked know, do not know such things. We know that the righteous one uh, that the person who acknowledges the poor acknowledges their maker, and the wicked reject their maker. We hear the need for caring for the poor in these passages, and we see that this, this virtuous wife doesn't pit her family against neighbor and neighbor against family like so many people do. It's possible to care about both. It's possible to actually prioritize the two. Many of us know people that ignore children and care for their neighbor, and we know people that will never do anything for their neighbor because they care so much for their family. But this virtuous wife is able to work for both. Now again, I want to make sure that you understand that this woman is doing incredible work in this situation. She is able to take care of both, and she challenges both progressive ideas of what women should do and conservative ideas. The progressive says that a woman should work and she should anywhere she wants, but that she should work for self-actualization, for finding her own personal joy, her own happiness, to satisfy her own agenda. Whereas the conservative person tries to limit, tries to add a law to the particular things that a woman can do. And again, I'm not talking in political terms. I'm not. I'm talking simply about ways of thinking. And so this this passage and the Bible challenges both notions. Women have a great deal of freedom of where they can work, 
but they are supposed to be working for family, for neighbor, for husband, for children, for the poor. That, con- that goes against many of our modern notions. It's, it's a community-oriented thing. And because of that, this woman blesses so many people. We see that blessing made apparent in verse 23. It says, Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes a seat among the elders of the land. He, this husband, because of his wife, is so respected because he and his wife get along so well. People are going to trust a husband if her, his wife gets along very well with him. After all, who knows a husband better than a wife? A wife that blesses her husband brings great, uh, brings great honor to him and vice versa. The blessing of a wife is a blessing to the husband, and the community blesses her and him for that. And not only does the community bless them, verse 28 tells us that the children of this woman bless her, that the children look at all of her virtues and bless her, and the husband, at the end of the day, gives a toast in verse 29, Proverbs 31, 29. He says this, Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. I imagine this toast as a sort of uh, almost recommitment, like a 25th anniversary acknowledgement of the wonder of this woman. This isn't the throwaway Facebook acknowledgement at an anniversary or a birthday. This is sincere. It's deep. This husband genuinely believes this about the virtuous wife. He believes that he has struck gold, and he blesses her because she has blessed him so much. And this woman lives in a reciprocal world of blessing where what she blesses blesses her back and vice versa because she lives in such harmony with the world around her. This again is like wisdom and we see that in Proverbs 4, 7 through 8. It says this, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. The blessings of wisdom that we receive in turn bless wisdom because we see its value. It's the same with the virtuous wife. So this virtuous wife is valuable. She works and she blesses and receives blessing all that fit under the proper rubric of true beauty. And we see what this mother says to her son about beauty in verse 30. It says this, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The book of Proverbs was written almost 3,000 years ago. And for 3,000 years, young men have needed that line over and over and over again. Because they need to understand the difference between true beauty and that which is fleeting, that which is fake. The same goes for women. We also, women also need this line because they need to hear that there's something deeper, more rich, more valuable than the airbrush beauty that's so celebrated in a culture of any day. This mother in this situation isn't a liar. She doesn't sit here and say that beauty is, is foolish and that, and that charm is nothing. Rather, she knows that young men, boys, are prone to focus on what's not important. They're prone to be deceived by things like chemistry, charisma, and and body type, and ignore the most important things, true virtue, wisdom, guidance, support. A husband is, a young man is is likely to look at a beautiful woman and overlook that she's pouty or disagreeable or that she doesn't work hard in view of the deception of beauty. Again, beauty and charm can be good things, but they are not as good as virtue, as wisdom, as truth and goodness. And because of this, we recognize that there's a beauty in this woman uh, that is often rejected, that isn't celebrated like it ought to be, especially amongst young men and young women. Why, like I have mentioned already, young men have a tendency to ignore this kind of wisdom. They ignore the sort of vision this mother gives her son. They look at the world around them and they see a celebration of physical beauty and charm and they say, that's what I want, and they ignore the bigger life picture. And because of that, there's a reciprocal relationship in the young women seeing what men actually value, and they say, this is what men care about. Cosmopolitan tells me this is what men really need and want, so I'm going to try to focus my energies and attention on that rather than true virtue and true beauty. And so there's a reciprocal relationship where the Proverbs 31 woman is not really cherished or valued in our world today. 
And if I'm right, which I think I am, then that means that we also don't value wisdom. That we don't value wisdom like we think we should. That if we are honest at the end of our book of Proverbs, that though we've been trying to celebrate wisdom, that we all still have a way to go. We still have a journey in appreciating and celebrating wisdom along the way, of looking at hard work and believing that it is good, at looking at the other nature, other focused uh, nature of this woman and believing that that is good for us. In other words, I believe that we, in some ways, to some degree, all fail this test a little bit. We celebrate the fleeting beauties of this world and, and we celebrate and ignore what really matters and what does not go away. So what I want to tell you, I want to, I want to talk to you about responding to the test. Again, my assumption is that we, in some sense, all fail the test to some degree. And I want to give us a three-stage response to that test, a three-stage response to the test. And that response goes like this. Moving from peculiarity to familiarity. These are stages in responding to the test. That we need to move from peculiarity to familiarity. We need to move from familiarity to desirability. And we need to move from desirability to dependence. I'll explain each of those in a second. Moving from peculiarity uh, to, to uh, familiarity means this. Um, I think if we're all honest, if you take a good look at the Proverbs 31 woman, at some point along the way, you think she's a little strange. Uh, there's a point or two, if you really are being honest with your reading of the scripture, she's a little odd. And what I want to do, what I think is important when we come to both wisdom and this woman, is that we need to move from seeing them as peculiar or strange to something that we understand, that we get, that we actually comprehend how this could even be good. Um, part of moving from peculiarity to familiarity is superficial. We need to be able to translate the cultural specifics of this woman to our modern day economy and home life. Uh, I do not recommend uh, you wives or women to dream one day of making all your clothes for your children. That's not what I hope you come away from Proverbs 31 with. You would probably be much better off using your time post-industrial revolution, getting a good job, and buying your clothes at Marshall's and then learning to sew if that's something you really wanted to do. Second of all, I don't encourage most of you ladies listening to my sermon to go out and buy a field and try to, buy it and, and try to start a vineyard. Not a good idea, especially in the state of Illinois, folks. The soil just is no good. And secondly, most of you need to learn how to actually grow a grape and actually make wine before you do something like that. So that's not what I'm after. What I'm after is helping you see and translate the cultural unfamiliarity to familiarity, but also her ways of life. Again, I think that most of us, if we look at her work, her efforts, we think that she is a little strange in how hard she works and how much she works. Um, some of us might be prone to assume this kind of woman might have a deadbeat husband at home. Why is she working so much? Or maybe an exacting husband who never lets her put her comfy pants on and watch Netflix. We are suspicious of a woman like this. We don't celebrate her. We don't honor her. She's unfamiliar to us. Still others of us might accuse her of having poor boundaries, of focusing too little on neighbor or focusing too little on the family. We, if we were confronted with such a woman, my contention is, is that she would not only be uh, unfamiliar to us, but perhaps even unlikable in the work that she presents. But, not on, but to help you with that, I want to make sure that you see the beauty a little bit of her particular type of work. Notice the diversity of the work of this woman. I want to make you familiar. The goal isn't to give you advice, but to make you familiar with her. In the Proverbs 31 woman, we see that she does a diversity of tasks. And I think this is important to be able to work like her. You see, uh, when we do different types of work, we exercise different muscles, if you will. She works at home, she works away from the home. Um, for some of you that work on computers or answering phone calls while you're at work, it's not a bad idea to go home and, do, and put away the computer and put away the phone and garden, cook, or something like that. You're working different muscles, and as you're working different muscles, it's less exhausting along the way. Again, I'm not giving you advice, I'm just helping you see that she's not so crazy after all. But secondly, what I, I want to recognize as strange to us in our culture is this other, other focused nature of this woman. Uh, a few years back, I believe it was 2016, I was doing some street evangelism at the Loyola L-Stop. 
And the conversation must have got off track somehow because I was interviewing a senior Loyola student um, and she said to us that under no circumstances would she ever want to have children. And we asked her why. And she said because they estimate right now that the children born in the year 2016 would cost their parents about $520,000 between the age of 0 and 22. This young woman literally could not stomach the cost of having children. Now she is an extreme example of what we see largely in our culture today. Our culture uh, sees a decrease in the number of children being born. It sees a prolonged and extended time of life where we don't get married. And of course we see the decrease in giving to the poor and charities and the like in our country. It's, the stats just prove this left and right. Our culture doesn't celebrate this type of thing. And so she's very unfamiliar to us. She is difficult for us to comprehend. She's difficult for us to grasp. And as Christians, we must see that there is good in her. And so she must move. Once we understand a little bit more about her, she must move from familiarity to desirability. She must move from being familiar to desirable. Now, at this point, I, I must acknowledge that if you are listening to the Proverbs 31 depiction of the virtuous wife, uh, some of you women probably feel a little weighed down by the depiction of her. She seems too good to be true. Uh, she's a model that you can never imagine being like. And what I want to hope for, what I want to encourage you, is that's besides the point. She is intentionally an exemplar. She is wonderful, not so that you could feel bad about yourself, but so that you could have a lifelong aspiration of the good and the true. Again, like I mentioned earlier, I imagine that this husband gives this woman a toast later in life, not at the beginning of marriage, but later. This is the sort of person that is crafted over a period of time. I have no illusions that my sermon is going to be so effective that by Friday all of you women are going to be Proverbs 31 women. That would be too much of a burden to bear. Rather, what I want you to do is to see that she is a perpetual and regular scripture-embedded model for life. I want her to be desirable to you because she is good and true. And for men, I want you to see that this woman offers you something if in wives, but also in sisters and friends that are good for the community that you're a part of, that you ought to celebrate, that she is good for your life. You see, I want this woman to be desirable to us because we believe uh, that at the end of the day, a life spent flipping between the channels, finding that there is nothing on, is less wonderful than working for the good of the others. I want us to see that a life lived where the world revolves around us is no life at all. I want us to see that there is genuine beauty and goodness in the life this woman lives, that it's actually the life that we were meant to live. I want us to move from familiarity to desirability. But last, again, I want us to move, it seems perhaps backwards to you, but it isn't, from desirability to dependence. From desirability to dependence. Even if you went away from here today and said, I want to be like the Proverbs 31 woman this week, if you really went after it hard, you would find at some point how difficult it is for you to become like her on your own. And you would find how unusual wisdom is to attain on your own. You see, we see in this woman an embodiment of something that is so wonderful and good and true, and we necessarily fail to achieve uh, reaching her status. But that doesn't need to leave us in despair, dear church. For we, are, as believers, also have another model of what wisdom looks like in life. But that model isn't simply a model. It is actually 3D reality, flesh and blood, God in flesh. You see, as Christians, we don't simply say, go and be like this woman and see how you fail and continue to go be like her. No, we say that, yes, here's the model of wisdom for women in the Scripture, but guess what? You don't have to become like her on your own. You see, we've been celebrating in the book of Proverbs that Jesus is not only a Savior from the penalty of our sins and even from the punishment of our folly, but He's also a Savior that makes us wise, that gives us what we lack. And so when you behold the Proverbs 31 woman, you're going to recognize as women that you're not her, as men that you're not worthy of her, that if you were married to such a woman, many of you would feel like deadbeats. She is so good and so true. And what you're to do when that happens isn't to go and try to do this on your own, but to go to your Lord and Savior and seek the wisdom that He alone has. 
Go to Him, He who clothes you in righteousness. Go to Him who labored night and day doing the work of God that He might rescue us for eternity. Go to Him who did good in all of His ways, who taught us what was right, who lived what was right, who could be touched, who could be felt. Go to Him who is a Savior that's as real as anyone listening today. Go to Him, the good, good and true. In the book of Colossians, we learned that Jesus is, has, a, has wisdom in Himself. He is the storehouse of wisdom for us all. All the treasures of wisdom are found in Him. And so when we look at the book of Proverbs, the way you know whether you got this or not, whether you are learning, whether you're understanding the test that Proverbs and the Proverbs 31 woman gives is if you're becoming more dependent. The way that you should be responding to the Proverbs 31 woman and this entire book is to say, I don't have this Christ, you have it. Please give it to me. You see, Jesus is not just a savior from sins. He's a savior through and through. And when you see the Proverbs 31 woman as she is women and men, you look at her and say, I'm below her, but Christ, you are, you are above her and you are the ultimate source and guide of wisdom. Make me like you. I've been following Jesus for 30 years right now. And over and over again, I realize how far I've, I've come, but also how far away from the wisdom that he offers I still am. He calls us to follow him by carrying a cross, and sometimes I, don't, I realize I don't even know the half of what that means. And so what I'm calling us to do, church, is to look at the Proverbs 31 woman as an example who is higher than us, but to not despair, to believe that every step along the way, as Christ is making us more wise, he is saving us and making us wise along the way. Will you let him do that work in you? Let's pray. Uh, Father, I want to ask you, I know that as we end this study in the book of Proverbs, I know that there is so much wisdom that still is to be gained from it. Uh, may our church go to it again and again for the wisdom it lacks. May we as leaders and pastors do the same. May the women of the church be inspired not not beat down by how they fall short of the Proverbs 31 woman. She is intentionally a beautiful image. And I pray that we would all uh, marvel at her, but also marvel at what uh, she reflects in terms of how much God wants to do in us, how much different he wants to make us than we are right now. And so Christ, we pray for that salvation, the salvation from the folly of our current day. Give us what is good and true, we pray in the name of Christ the Lord. Amen. And let's respond by singing, Be Thou My Vision, especially verse 2 says, Be Thou My Wisdom and Thou My True Words. We look to, to God our Father.
Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Pastor Jeremiah. Uh, we appreciate the word and the worship and song. Uh, Pastor Jeremiah, Stephen, uh, and myself are, again, available for prayer. Uh, this is our Sunday prayer for healing, so uh, please contact the church or any of us directly if you have our contact information or email. Uh, we desire to pray for you uh, and uh, get together with you and lay hands on you. Uh, if that's something that you feel that you need. So please take advantage of that. We do desire to honor God and to set you before his throne uh, for healing. Uh, again, the announcements for this week, Blue Sky Agape Community is meeting at 6.30 at the Johnsons this week. Uh, contact me, Steve Johnson 34 at hotmail.com. No returns, uh, meeting September 16th at 6.30 on Zoom. That's a Wednesday, September 16th, 6.30 on Zoom. Please contact Laura Bruggers at lnbruggers at gmail.com. Works in progress, 7 p.m. at Pastor, at the Vaults' place, Pastor Jeremiah's home, Tuesday, September 8th at 7 p.m., September 8th, this Tuesday. Uh, women's prayer meeting, 7 p.m. tomorrow, that's Monday, on Zoom. Please contact Molly at hassettmb at gmail.com. Again, we are out into the park for as long as the Lord allows. Yes, we will be chilling until at least October 25th. And if the Lord is gracious, we might be out there the next week as well. So we need people to help us set up and break down in the park on Sunday. So if that's something that uh, the Lord has burned onto your heart, a desire to help and to serve, please contact Ralph for that as well. So we've looked at Proverbs now, and over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at the life of the prophet Isaiah. This is in 1st and 2nd Kings, at the end of 1st Kings and at the beginning of 2nd Kings. And it's a good idea to grab the context of that. So uh, if you haven't read Proverbs, I'm going to encourage you to read those chapters 10 through 30 and then uh, also pick up to get the context of where we'll be going in the life of Elijah. Read 1 Kings and 2 Kings and I'm telling you it is a fantastic read. I mean in these books you're going to find a conflict between a righteous God who graciously redeemed Israel and an Israel who breaks God's law and takes their favorite status for granted. And yes, there's history, and yes, there's theology, and yes, there's prophecy in there. But, you know, this also overlays very well uh, politically on the time that we're going through right now in our own lives. So I encourage you to take a read of First and Second Kings this week so you can get a better understanding of the life of the prophet Elijah and where he fits in what it is that God is doing in First and Second Kings. Now you're charging your blessing. Go out into the world trusting with your hearts the wisdom God so generously bestows on those who seek to follow his will. Live wisely in the Lord's name and glorify him in all you do. And may the grace and the mercy and the wisdom of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit be your support and your guidance and your strength from this day forward. Go in peace. Thanks for joining us today.